Welcome to Transforming Assessment for the May 5th session. Today's session is about self-assessment and we'll be having two speakers today, one on serious games and one on using team-based learning. Um, the session will be introduced by Fabio. Would you like to introduce, please? Of course, and uh, good morning, everybody from Norwich, United Kingdom, and uh, good afternoon and good evening from for all of you that are uh, connecting from different parts of the world, I always get really excited when, when I see such an international crowd uh, gathered uh, to share the same passion for assessment. And, and as usual, uh, thank you, Matthew, for giving us the opportunity to share uh, this uh, session together. Today, we are going to talk about uh, self-assessment um, in, uh, in different ways. And uh, this is uh, a uh, joint session where uh, Transforming Assessment, uh, which is joining us, uh, is hosting the uh, Assessment in Higher Education Network, uh, um, to which I belong. So my name is uh, Fabio Rico, and I'm based at the University of East Anglia, and I'm going to be uh, the chair of this uh, webinar. Uh, in the room, we also have uh, Fiona Merings uh, from the University of Bradford, and Fiona is going to monitor the chat and uh, help me out to direct the questions and provide answers to um, questions that you might have for our speakers. But before we start, please uh, allow me to um, uh, say a couple of words about the assessment in our education network. We are an independent network uh, focused on developing uh, researching for practice in assessment and feedback in our education. We are based uh, at the University of Cumbria um, in England. The, um, our committee is uh, composed of an international representation and we are interested in uh, everything related to assessment. It could be uh, professional fields, academic fields, um, uh, practice innovation evaluation, everything related to assessment uh, is most certainly um, of interest for us. We have an annual conference. Um, unfortunately, this year we're not going to be able to go live. Uh, as we had optimistically planned to begin with. But we are confident that uh, we're going to be able to uh, see all our friends next year. In the meantime, we're going to run a, um, a free event uh, online, and this is going to take place on the 1st of July. Uh, so uh, please come and register on our website. Uh, the event is free, and we got a, a couple of uh, nice uh, keynotes uh, lined up for you. and. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. But um, moving uh, on to um, the opportunity to showcase some of the nice contributions that we receive uh, for our conference. And um, uh, we uh, would like to uh, run this webinar with two presentations. The first one uh, by Jane Coleman uh, from Glasgow Caledonia University on uh, serious gaming. And the second one by Paul McDermott, the University of East Anglia on finding confidence in the numbers. So we're going to have uh, 15 minutes for each of the presenters with a quick um, um, uh, question and answer session of just five minutes, any burning questions, but then we are gonna have plenty of time to have a debate uh, in the second part of the session when uh, we are over the two presentations. So without uh, any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Jane Coleman from Glasgow Caledonia University. Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fabio. Um, welcome, everyone. So um, as Fabio just said, my name is Jane Coleman and I am a lecturer in physiotherapy at Glasgow Caledonia University in Scotland. So for this presentation, what I would like to do is to stir some interest and hopefully add to your understanding and awareness of serious gaming and its potential as a formative assessment tool. So. The plan for the session is to establish some of the background for the evaluation I undertook with regards to formative assessment design and what I mean by serious gaming. To introduce serious gaming and the task that I created, which was a competitive team based quiz, then present the outcome of the evaluation I undertook. Finally, to kind of bring things to a conclusion, have a look at the outcomes I collected and then propose some considerations for future practice. So I feel it's really important when we're doing these kind of webinars and because we can sometimes be coming at things from different perspectives, it's important to establish some kind of context. 
so for myself the two areas I'm going to focus on um, in the next wee while are the current trends in formative assessment design as some background context for the evaluation overall and then the role of game-based learning and serious gaming as a possible assessment tool. So just to get the ball rolling and to see if you guys are happy with some of the technology if you look at the top of the screen there's a T icon and that'll allow you to if you click on that that'll allow you to type onto the screen so just to get a bit of grounding as to kind of our current thoughts as a group on formative assessment if you feel that you would like to if you could write a word or a phrase onto the slide what your understanding or what how you would define formative assessment at the minute fantastic So we've got keywords like feedback, developmental, scaffolding, it's for learning has come up several times. It's actionable, it's ungraded, there's low stakes, helps to motivate. Shows how we can move things forward. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for everyone who um, wrote on the slide. So yeah, that actually um, leads us in really nicely to say that overall, whilst it is ill-defined within the literature, actually, when we speak to our practice colleagues, actually, we're all coming from the, the same perspective. We're all looking at that assessment for learning. Some of the common features, though, if we do look at the literature, are that best practice formative assessment includes student self-regulation and an opportunity for students to address issues with self-efficacy and assessment anxiety and this also um, adds their ability to develop what we call assessment literacy so that's that understanding of the assessment process and the assessment criteria more recently as many of you identified on the slide before there's been a drive for kind of authentic assessment design active engagement by the student with the formative assessment task often we see we want to see um, progress we want the student to, be able to see their progress see their learning and that only comes from developing tasks that have meaning absolutely all of you identified that assessments becoming more learning centered and the assessment design formative assessment design in particular has become more synonymous with those principles of assessment for learning as opposed to the more traditional assessment of learning um, that we do still see, but there is um, less kind of best practice. So for this evaluation, just to give us a little bit of structure, the serious gaming task that I developed as part of this formative assessment was designed and evaluated against the five key strategies for formative assessment design proposed by William and Thompson in 2008. And I think these just give us a really nice structure and lead well and link well to those features that we've just discussed um, about effective and efficient formative assessment design. So just to quickly whip through them. Number one, clarifying, sharing and understanding learning intentions and the criteria for success. In this instance, as I said, we wanted to look at assessment literacy. Number two, engineering effective classroom discussions, questions and tasks that elicit evidence of learning. Again, in this instance, we wanted the students to be able to see their learning in a meaningful way. Providing feedback that moves learning forward, that assessment for learning. Number four, activating students as instructional resources for one another. So there's an element to the design that was team based and so we're encouraging that peer support that again I said we was recognized in the literature as something that was beneficial to student outcomes and then finally number five activating students as the owners of their own learning and that's creating that opportunity for self-regulation self-awareness ownership of their learning and again that has led to more positive outcomes so looking at the 
specifics of the evaluation, I've chucked out there a couple of phrases, particularly on the first slide, serious gaming. Well, what does what do I mean by serious gaming or game based learning? So again, if you feel confident and would like to add a phrase or a statement onto the slide using the text tool, that'd be great just to see where the group are with regards to this aspect of the presentation. Lovely, yep. Definitely gaming with purpose, with learning in mind. Should be fun. Lovely, I like that phrase, phrase, edutainment. Might have to pinch that word. Again, that low stakes linking back to its potential role as a formative assessment tool. Making learning fun. Lovely, right. So we do have a really good awareness of what game-based learning and or serious gaming is, but I will just put a few couple of definitions up just to clarify because some of the terminology is becoming a little bit overlapped within some of the literature and it's worth just defining the difference between game-based learning and serious gaming. So thank you everyone for that. So when I was looking through the evidence base for an alternative formative assessment tool, which is what sparked this evaluation, and one that linked to those five key strategies of formative assessment design that we've just talked through, that's when I came across game-based learning and serious gaming. So game-based learning, as you've identified, is where fun or play is introduced to an educational task, and this is to promote student engagement. It follows key educational principles that hopefully we're all quite happy with, such as Vygotsky's social constructivism, Kolb's experiential learning theory, and again, echoes that assessment for learning where we're encouraging doing as opposed to kind of pure studying with regards to learning and achieving um, those outcomes. Hopefully we're all quite familiar with that, where serious gaming takes things one step further and is much more that educational focused. It requires a clear educational purpose. So in this instance, addressing assessment outcomes or increasing that assessment literacy. And it moves away from that solely kind of entertainment aspect with much more focus on active and meaningful learning by the student. So if we consider assessment for learning principles, I think due to its clear educational purpose and the possibility to align assessment outcomes to serious gaming tasks, plus introducing that active engagement and meaningful learning, that's what sparked my interest in serious gaming as a possible form of formative assessment. It seemed to align really nicely, like I said, to those five key strategies of formative assessment design. So let's have a quick look at the evaluation I undertook, talk you through the specific task. So serious gaming was the broader umbrella term and what I created was a competitive team based quiz underneath that umbrella and then look at the outcomes that were collected from it. So, as I said, serious gaming requires an educational purpose and in this instance, the purpose was to create an opportunity for the students to review their current knowledge and experience what a summative would ass assessment would be like. So again, that Kolb's experiential learning, giving them some insight into what's expected of them. Like, as I said, that assessment literacy, what's the criteria going to be like? Now, for a wee bit of background, the summative assessment was a theory practice viva. So the students had to answer questions about clinical pathologies, their assessment and treatment and then link this to knowledge about anatomy and pathophysiology learned in previous modules. The quiz structure and the use of unseen questions meant that the task was meaningful because the students had to be able to think independently and on their feet in the first instance. And they also had to respond verbally. And that verbal format, again, directly linked to the summative assessment and the viva. So, that linking theory to practice and verbalising their answers was something that had previously been noted as um, a weakness 
or troublesome to the students in previous cohorts and it was something that I particularly wanted to focus on in this formative assessment. I did, like I said, I designed the team-based quiz to incorporate those five key strategies for formative assessment design. So, for example, by adding a choice of answering with different point allocations, I was able to incorporate student self-regulation and that peer support. So, as you can see on the slide, the students were able to either answer the question independently for two points or work with their team for one point. The design of the quiz being in real time was slightly different to traditional serious gaming and on the larger scale game based learning because it didn't include digital technology in this instance. The reason it didn't was because as it was a verbal assessment and the summative required a verbal assessment, it didn't it wasn't constructively aligned to have it in an online platform. However that the use of online platforms will be something we talk about in the conclusion. So just for reference, this is just how I aligned the competitive team based quiz to those five key strategies. But again, the key things were assessment literacy, the task needed to be meaningful, there was opportunity for feedback and students to see their learning, team based element allowed for peer support, and there was opportunity for self regulation. So prior to the session, as with any evaluation or research, I spoke to the students and because I think it's always really important that collaboration with the um, students can add to your research. And I sought their consent to use the quiz and gather their feedback via an anonymized paper survey. After the quiz, I do, did get secondary consent to use um, and analyze their feedback and to use it in this instance with you guys in this webinar. I had 14 students give consent and provide feedback. What the feedback went through was low level thematic analysis, pulled out key themes and key words. And then as you can see from the word cloud, many of the things that you guys identified on that slide about what formative assessment should include and then what game based learning and serious gaming could include, they picked up. So that it was fun, it was helpful, it helped them understand, there was learning, there was a competitive element, that's that serious gaming part. The tutor was involved, it was really um, helpful. If we dig down a little bit deeper into some of the qualitative feedback and link them to those key strategies, specifically, as I've mentioned, assessment anxiety and self-regulation, the students fed back. One in particular, they felt that the quiz was very helpful and fun, and help them to understand what they needed to work on and give them confidence. For the assessment literacy component, it was good to be individually challenged. So again, maybe linking to self-regulation above as well, and to learn that exam structure and to get a better insight into the actual exam. It was a good way to revise, and it was just like the exam. Recognizing that final part, peer support, that team element. So it could have just been a, a you know a pop quiz where they worked independently, but I wanted to encourage that team element element because of the research saying that that peer support was really important. And again, the feedback was really positive for that. It was great. There was I needed to work on, but didn't feel too stressed or singled out. I could ask my teammates. So again, they all link together. Assessment anxiety, self-regulation, assessment literacy, and peer support were all seemingly achieved and supported a positive outcome by adopting a serious gaming tool as a formative assessment. Just to sum up the outcomes, I was really, really pleased to see this um, quote from one of my students, because like I said, it does sum up what the students experienced and it give, it's really suggestive that a competitive team-based quiz um, because of its clear educational purpose, can achieve the outcomes we want it to. So it was really fun, brought the group together, gave a framework for what we should know or knowledge we need to touch on, and was able to see strengths and weaknesses of current learning. So just to bring things to a close, because I've probably talk, been talking a wee bit longer than I should, I'll summarise those outcomes and then we'll have a little look on considerations for future practice because any research needs to be forward looking. And if we're looking at assessment for learning, then we need to be looking at for learning in our own assessment 
of the tools we use. So in summary, the outcome of the evaluation supported the use of serious gaming, in this instance, a competitive team based quiz um, as a suitable formative assessment tool because there was opportunity for that self-regulation and peer support. The students reported that the task was fun and helpful, but because it encouraged them to engage and this had a positive influence on their assessment anxiety and literacy. The students were able to see and experience the quiz as a meaningful educational task, which aligned to the summative assessment they were about to do, but also aligned to the assessment for learning process. Again, reducing some of those stress and anxiety about what the assessment might be like. Like I said, it's always important when doing evaluation research to continue to look forward. So as with all research, limitations of my evaluation, of course, prevent me from saying that serious gaming is best practice and should everyone should include it in formative assessment design. In this instance, the limitations were that the sample size was too small, so it's really hard to generalize. I only um, included undergraduate graduate students, which means factors such as previous experience of, say, a verbal assessment in this instance, or their own self-efficacy or their own developing assessment literacy could have an impact. So say so I had um, completed this evaluation with master's students, postgraduate students, would the outcomes have been different? I designed the task in the quiz format because I best felt it aligned to the summative assessment design. But this the task design might not suit other types of assessment. It definitely wouldn't suit maybe a more traditional essay type. And then finally, as I said, in this instance, I didn't use any of the, any technologies which are traditionally associated with game based learning and serious gaming because I didn't feel it fitted. But with our, you know, with education becoming more online and our use of digital platforms, it's something that will need to be taken into consideration um, for future evaluations. And also taking into consider the influence of digital platforms. So we spoke about peer support and many of you will have recognized over the last year or so because of the pandemic and that move to online learning, how different student relationships with each other and with us has become because of having to engage over a digital platform and could that influence their engagement with the task because some of the features of the platforms we use do encourage that engagement and some actually do limit it and then how do the their peer relationships develop and how could they be affected and again would it be as effective online as it was in person So that just sums up what I've just spoken through. So whilst it is recognised within literature, and you guys recognised it on the slide, that there is that link between assessment and student learning, and this should be common practice. Serious gaming has been shown to be effective, but future practice does need to look at appropriate sample sizes and study levels. Different tasks need to be reviewed, not just a team based quiz. And then exploring those use of technologies um, and that digital format will be key for the future. And this is being undertaken in the UK. The Healthcare Professions Council did commission a study in 2018, a review, systematic review of the use of game based learning and serious gaming within health education. However, um, due to COVID, it was put on the back burner. So one was completed in 2018, but a review was due in 2020. So we are still waiting for that. So Whistle Stop Tour, there are the references I've put through the slide. There are other resources available that I'd be happy to send anyone like it will happily share my email and contact details for anyone um, interested. And thank you very much for listening. So I can see a few questions in the chat. If I skew up a bit. Yes, uh, Jane, there was a, a question by Mike about uh, whether accessibility disability were considered in the design of um, the assessment that you presented. Yes, yes, absolutely. 
So um, because this was a second year group and I had been with them for the two years, so in um, the UK, it's either a, a, a three or a four year program. I was aware of um, any issues, say kind of um, any dyslexia issues or specific learning disabilities. And I did have a um, visually impaired student in the group. So when I was creating the quiz, I took that into account and made sure that the format and the font and the text size of all the questions that they pulled out of the proverbial hat were appropriate to that individual. And then if there was any more definite, if we wanted to consider the mental health of the students, because we did have touched upon assessment anxiety and it can be underpinned by kind of um, panic disorders. Um, that was taken into account because it was done and I had in a more in a less formal way, which in a, again was key to it. And I had already approached the school students in that collaborative way to discuss with them what I would like to do and the reasons for it and what my intentions were. So there was always that clarity. But of course, with any um, assessment and any new tool or intervention, um, accessibility and, and disability needs to be taken into account. But for this instance, it was done in a more personal way because I need my students. Of course. And um, yes, we, we, we can perhaps uh, move to the next presentation, but I see there are uh, also comments uh, talking about how this uh, kind of design can really generate some sort of really good uh, peer um, tutoring um, with, with, within groups. Um, so please, uh, colleagues, uh, keep uh, uh, typing comments in the chat. And of course, Jane can also reply uh, via chat. But, um, we are going to now give uh, room to um, Paul for, uh, for his presentation um, on um, finding confidence in numbers. And then we're going to have a plenary session where we can actually discuss the two presentations. But thank you very much, Jane, for, for your presentation. And uh, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fabio. <clears throat> I say good morning and good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, so my name is Paul McDermott. I'm a um, senior lecturer in medicinal chemistry within the School of Pharmacy at UEA. So I wanted to talk to you today about um, just some work I've been doing that's actually been going on for a couple of years now, looking at um, uh, self-assessment data that we find within a certain multiple choice quiz format that we use. I apologize up front, I've put way too many slides in for the time allocated. Uh, so I'm gonna push on, uh, it's a sort of cardinal sin, but um, yeah, I didn't plan this very well, but hopefully we'll be able to get through all the content in time. So, um, so I'm interested very much in self-assessment. So just to set the scene, of course, so uh, self-assessment can be defined as information about the learners provided by the learners themselves. Um, and what got me interested in this um, is the Dunning-Kruger effect, really. So just from a quick scan of the literature, the most popular methodology for measuring self-assessment that I came across was to give the students some form of assessment, usually a multiple choice quiz. Um, so you get a, a line for their actual grades and then to get the students to predict how they actually thought they did in that quiz. And this is applicable to lots of different scenarios. Dunning and Kruger themselves talk about it being applied to people rating how well they did in a driving test or how likely they are to um, pin the tail on a donkey, things like that. So it can be applied across a whole spectrum of humanity really uh, but obviously I was seeing it in the context of uh, multiple choice quizzes about uh, the student's own subject um, and what comes up time and time again is what's shown in this plot here I'm sure I'm teaching you all to suck eggs but for those who haven't seen the Dunning-Kruger effect I think this is the best graphical representation where you have the line here which is the actual grades that the students got and they separate the class into quartiles so we have the lowest performing quartile here highest here and then this line is the grade they actually predicted for themselves and then you look at the relationship between these two lines and i'm always drawn to the two extremes of this chart so it's these um students here that tend to get the most attention these are the students that are described as being doubly cursed so they don't know much but also there's a metacognitive deficiency they don't know that they don't know much which manifests in this massive over prediction of how they thought they did uh, go that sort of decreases as you go through the grade spectrum up to the best performers and it tends to be that the best performers 
tend to underestimate their ability, but not by much. So we describe these as still being very well calibrated. These two points are very close together, but these students tend to underestimate their confidence. And this is almost the opposite of um, what we see at this end of the chart, because these students, they do know what they know. They're well calibrated, but they're always questioning. They're always doubting a little bit, which is probably going to lead into more beneficial learning behaviours influence and to go back to review what they understand the literature and they get into quite a positive reinforcement cycle in their learning and then you have all of the colors in between for the other students so I was really interested in these plots I think it's really quite a beneficial thing if you can start to look at what the students understand about themselves and also get them to think about that as well so that's what got me into all of this um, and I was also interested in it because I've been doing team-based learning for quite a while anyway uh, and I saw within the MCQ format that we were using an opportunity to look into this sort of thing so for those there's probably been plenty of people here who are familiar with team-based learning um, but part of the approach is to do an individual multiple choice quiz with the students but using this very specific answer format for the quiz so there's let's say four answer options a b c d there's only one correct answer but instead of getting the students to just tick which answer they think is correct, um, most TBL practitioners will say, well, actually, you've got four points and you can spread those points out across the answer options as you see fit. And the aim of this was to give students partial credit, because in a conventional multiple choice quiz, you might think, oh, the answer could be C or it could be A, but you have to pick a lane. And if you go A, great. But if you tick C here and you get it wrong, you don't get the partial credit for thinking, actually, there are reasons why I think it could be A. Whereas in a long answer question, you get partial credit. Everything you get down that's correct, you get marks for, whereas it's, it's sort of too extreme in many people's opinions with MCQs. So that's what the plan was here. But of course, when you look at this, students are separating their marks out based on their confidence. So if you're 100% confident, you can stick all four marks on your given answer option. If you're 50-50 between two options, you can spread your marks two and two. If you're 75% confident, you can stick three on C, you can stick one on D. If you have no idea, you can tell us you have no idea and bag one point at the very least, and then two, one, one to the other possible answer option. So it's designed this format to give um, partial credit, but also we feel it's also giving an indication of the student's confidence. So it's a, another way of gathering that self-assessment um, data, we felt. And I thought this was potentially a very powerful thing to do when I looked at the answer options. So this is actual answer, um, test answers, is actual real data from students. So you have a student here who's obviously right at the top of the performance spectrum, 97.22% of the test. And you can see that they're their answer strategy will probably line up with what you'd expect so they're very confident but they're also well calibrating their confidence they're going all four points on one given answer option but they're hitting that you're getting it correct each time so there's justified confidence there they were 50 50 here so they're the only two marks that they lost what you'd expect from a high performing student if we go down to the other end of the spectrum so this student only got 29.17 percent again what you'd expect they're spreading their marks a lot more. They're not as confident. And also they're not hitting their marks very much as well. So quite a lot of questions wrong. Again, probably what you'd expect. Um, Fabio would describe this as having much higher entropy in their answer strategy. But the really interesting thing is if I can, I'll show you some uh, data now from a student who got exactly the same grade, 29.17%. But I, I, I'd imagine everyone in the, in the room here would say, we do not treat this next student quite the same as the previous student because look at their answer strategy they've got a similar level of entropy to the highest performing student but of course there's no calibration here in their confidence they're very answering with a very high confidence strategy but there it's not a justified confidence they're not getting the answers correct they're missing the marks that they're for now there could be lots of reasons why students are answering like this it may be that they're uh, a classic Dunning Kruger candidate that they don't know what they don't know, they feel they do know it, so they're answering with a confident strategy, but they're, they're getting it wrong a lot of the time. It could be that they know that they don't really know much, but they've strategically decided, well, I'm just going to stick all four on anyway, because the difference between zero and one is pretty minimal. Or it could be they're just completely checked out. You know, there, there's some other reason that they just don't care about this quiz, or they're, they're just choosing to sabotage themselves. Lots of reasons, but you need the qualitative data to explain this quantitative. 
but the quantitative data is a really nice starting point. So I decided it'd be nice to really dig into this and start to process these numbers and look for patterns. So um, the way we presented this years ago is like, well, you know, in a classic Dunning-Kruger model, you get the grades and you get the students to actually explicitly predict what grade they thought they'd get. Whereas using this approach, it's a bit like Schrodinger's cat. You never have to collapse the wave function. You never have to open the box because the students don't know they're giving you self-assessment data. They're just using a sort of an answer strategy to get the best mark for themselves. And if we can infer from their answer strategy their level of confidence, then we get that self-assessment data without ever having to ask the students what they thought. And we wondered if this would be an interesting um, metric to use, if we get any useful information from it. So what we did was we take the students' data, put it into a spreadsheet. So I transcribed at first all of the students' answer strategies into a spreadsheet here. And for each question, so you've got questions one, two, three, four, five here in, in the columns, we applied quite a simple calculation. It was the maximum allocation divided by the number of allocations divided by four. And I think this column here is the best column to explain that. So the highest points allocation of these three is obviously two because they've gone two, one, one. But there's three cells that have uh, any marks allocated to them. So this student would be two, the highest points allocation, divided by three because there's three cells with um, any points allocated. That's how much the marks have been spread out. That gives us a number that we then divide by four because we want the number we get to be out of one rather than out of four because at the end of the day, we're going to average this, this score to get a number out of one. And if we multiply that by 100, we get a grade calculated from how they spread their marks out. So we just applied this across all of the students. So this, this would be four divided by one divided by four, which is one. This is two divided by three divided by four, which is 0.167 go across all of the questions and get an average for these numbers and multiply that by 100. So this student, from just looking at how they spread their answers, we predicted for them or we calculated the confidence for them as 83%. So that's their grade. We then have their actual grade, which was 85%. So this is quite well calibrated. And then we also, just as an additional tool, we said, well, actually, let's get them to predict their grades as well. So this student predicted that they got 55%. So we have three lines in our graph now. This green line is from us calculating their grade based on how much they spread their answers. The blue line is the grade they actually got when we marked the paper. The red line is the grade they predicted for themselves. And then we just looked at the plots we got and tried to understand them really, and tried to understand the patterns. So this is what the plots look like. Um, so if you remember from the previous slide, this green line at the top here, that's the grade that we calculated from how much they split their points in the MCQs. The blue line runs along the middle. That's their actual grades. And we've separated the class into quartiles here. That's why we've got the four points on the plot. So the lowest performers here are up to the highest performers. And then the red line is what they thought they got. That's their actual predicted grade here. And it's been quite interesting to look at these plots and to see the relationships between them. And we've applied this in formative assessments as well as summative. I tend to steer away from summative assessments now and use it only in formative, but we, there have been a couple of occasions where we've used this in quite low stakes summative assessments and we've seen some different patterns emerging. So what I'd like to do, I've got lots of data sets for this. I'd like to talk about one particular data set. And as I say, when we're looking at these plots, we're trying to go back to what I talked about with that original Dunning-Kruger plot. We're trying to look mainly at the relationship between uh, the actual grade and their predicted grade. Uh, and we're just trying to see how the other line, that green line at the top, maybe affects that interplay. And of course, there are other factors because we're doing multiple rounds of formative assessment, as you'll see. And what I wanted to see from the class is I wanted to see this gap close. That's the main thing I really wanted to see. I wanted to see a greater level of self-awareness. So I'd, I'd rather this gap close by this point coming up to this point. If they met somewhere in the middle, I still think that there's, there's improvement there. There's benefit from a learning perspective there. And then I was really interested to see how, you know, this point and all of the other points here uh, change with regards to calibration. And, and the original hypothesis is, of course, if you get better calibration, if you get, you know, 
less of a distance between these two points, you've got better self-awareness from the students. So I've done this quite a lot. We've used this quite a lot. It's a popular methodology anyway. I'd like to talk to you about um, some data we got this year from um, pre-registration pharmacy trainees. So these are students who've got their master's degree. They're now doing their pre-registration training year. So they're actually out on the job um, working and learning, and they're going to have one big exam at the end of the year. And if they pass that, they quite uh, register as pharmacists. Uh, and our university has the training contract for the whole of the East of England to actually do a lot of the training and learning with the pre-regs for the hospitals in our region of the country. So we've got a nice uh, sample size of 80 uh, quite high level students here and we get them periodically through the year for study blocks to go through some exercises with them. Um, and I mean I'm not a pharmacist myself, I'm a chemist, but um, I do teach on this and the one thing that I've introduced into this um, training program is clinical decision making uh, exercises. So every time they come to us for a study block, they would have had X number of months learning on the job, that experiential learning. They'd have had training from us in the study block. They'd have had preparation materials before the study block. Uh, and we really wanted to see quite a synoptic test here on how all of that training affected their clinical decision making ability. And pharmacists are moving to being much more of a prescribing healthcare professional now. The new standards for the GPHC have said that pharmacists who graduate and qualify will qualify straight away as prescribers very soon. So we're really interested in how their clinical decision making skills are, um, are developing. So what I recommended to the pre-reg uh, training program is well, let's use this methodology to see their clinical decision making so they've got all of this pre-learning it's not specifically tailored to clinical decision making but it, it should benefit their clinical decision making and at the end of their study block let's do a sort of t-based learning um readiness assurance process with them so we're just borrowing some methodologies from tbl and what that means is they'll sit an individual test using that answer format that i've just described so they'll have i think 20 clinical scenarios and they need to make a decision they need to essentially decide what medication is best or what outcome or action is best they then do exactly the same test as a group using the if at scratch cards uh, and it's a bit of a game for that because as a group they have to get the highest possible score so if they scratch off and get the answer right first time they get four points second time two points third time one if they don't get it till the fifth time, they get zero points. So there's a lot of peer instruction discussion as they decide which answer option to scratch off next. And as they're going through that, of course, they then get the answer every time they scratch off the card. So they're getting immediate item level feedback. And then to add a bit of authenticity into this, we also from previous years knew the hardest questions. So we gave those to the trainees and said, well, actually, don't do these now. Go back to your trust. Uh, and do try and answer this clinical scenario, this clinical question in a more authentic setting, like with peers, with discussion, with access to resources, with within a multidisciplinary healthcare team, and we'll see how that comes out. So that's the program we recommended, all formative. And I'm just showing you really the, the data that we got from the individual tests here. There's lots of other elements to this, um, but from a metrics point of view, it's just the individual tests. So we've done this for three years now. The first two years, they came to us, we stayed in a hotel for a week, and at the end of that study block, they did this process in person, in groups like this, around a table discussing. Um, because of COVID, and actually now because of funding reasons, most of the learnings moved online for these study blocks. So, but we were able to do exactly the same TBL process using this brilliant software into Dashboard, uh, which allowed us to have all of the functionality that we've previously had for in-person learning. So we were quite interested to see how that change of dynamic to online affected things. So these are the actual plots we got. So this is face to face. On the right is this year where it's all online. So this is the data we got from their induction. They hadn't had any teaching. This is the first time they'd seen this process. Uh, so these are the plots we've got. You'll find in all of these plots, the calculated confidence always sits higher than the other two lines up here. This is probably the closest you'll ever see that calculated line here. And you've got almost like well, quite a Dunning-Kruger profile when you look at how the red and the blue lines match up. Remember, red is predicted, blue is actual. So the top performers are slightly underconfident, the bottom performers are slightly over, but you've got essentially complete calibration in the middle here. 
And if you compare the two, compare online and in person, fairly comparable. The, the grades are a bit lower for the calculated confidence online compared to in person. The actual grade was fairly comparable, two percentage points in it. The predicted grades online were quite high, much higher than when they're predicting the grades after doing this team test in person. So already we've got some differences, but then things tend to kind of line up after that. And this is probably the most important thing here. Just at the second time of doing this, a couple of months later, this predicted grade for the top performance just drops. And you'll probably you'll see now that this number, the average predicted grade, doesn't change as we go through the rest of the study blocks. And we see this quite significant level of underconfidence, particularly in the top two performing quartiles. So again, the grades are comparable with online and in person. The CAE grade is matching up and the predicted grades matching up. There's quite a big drop from that second. And really, you know, that, that remains quite constant throughout. You get this flat line across the middle. And our task is really to understand why this was happening. So um, slight differences, we've got quite a big difference. They're going with much higher confidence answer strategies online in study block two compared to what's in person. The grade was actually significantly higher, but their predicted confidence, much less of a, a disparity. And we're seeing this flat line appear. Then we go on to study block two, safe predicted grade. Look at this flat line through here. The relationship now between the green and the blue line is changing. And I always see this green line as kind of like the aspirational line. If they can get that blue line up to that aspirational line, they're doing really well. But that's happening, but it's not going hand in hand with an increase in their predicted grade. Really interesting information from our point of view and something we need, we, we need to understand. Qualitative helps to explain the quantitative. So we did a quick and dirty evaluation of this. So we asked them, like at scale, what do you think of the ele elements of these, this uh, exercise? What do you think of the individual test? What do you think of the group test? What do you think of the exercise where you go back to your hospitals? Largely positive. So, um, you know, most are four or five out of five for the individual test and the team test. Still positive for the group elements, but less so. Um, so the hospital elements, but less so. But overall, I mean, the students for years have always really liked this. But really interesting stuff came out in sort of the verbatim comments. So we asked them to explain their ratings for what they thought of each of these elements. And this is when it was delivered online. They're actually really positive about the team learning. So that was good. It showed us that the top what software we were using facilitated those group discussions, which is really nice. They actually struggled more with the post-residential exercise. I think we have to keep this in context. This is right in the middle of the COVID outbreak and they're in hospital. So they probably didn't have much time for these extra exercises uh, and their comments came back and reflected that. But there were some nice comments coming through where they're being quite reflective about, you know, how this exercise uh, makes them think. So, so just from the being positive about team learning and the post-residential struggles, there's quite a few comments that tied those two together. So typical here, found the MCQs really useful, consolidated my learning at the end of the study block. I didn't find the post residential exercises useful, basically because there was only you know one or two members of the team that actually did it. The others were off doing other things. Bottom quote: Good to discuss things as a team. You get different opinions. Post residential exercise was a bit of a struggle, basically. So that was a bit of learning we could take back from that. But it was nice to see quite reflective comments coming out. You know, someone saying it was a really good exercise because you know. I was able to see where I was confident and also what I needed to work on. You know, so they talk about how their confidence matches their ability, what they do, what they don't know. You know, so they're really appreciating the feedback, which is largely internal feedback generated from their answers and the discussions with their peers before we really got involved. You know, multiple choice when done well forces you to think about your response, you know, learn about the options by rationalizing. So there's some really nice reflective answers coming in. We also, um, and that's probably the last thing I'll talk about looking at time, ask them to talk about how they answered, what was their strategy in predicting their grade? Because that's what we want to know why this line flat lines, this red line. So we had pretty equal split between students who were quite data driven in how they predicted their answer. So they were looking at the numbers and then predicting their answers based on that. And we'll see some quotes. And there were some that were more subjective. Oh, I reckoned I got this. And so this is what I went with. And then there's this other phenomenon that comes out. That I'll probably fold all of these um, 11 into, which is sort of, just a general sort of non-rationalized underconfidence or worry about perception and i think these three factors are combining into 
the sort of predicted grade that we were seeing. So data driven, they're saying, well, I predicted the score based on how confident I felt. I looked at the number of, they were out of fives and four here, the number of fives I placed versus the number of ones and twos. Um, so they were actually looking at the numbers and then having that feedback into their own sort of self-assessment. Same here, I'd count up the scores um, I was sure on, use that as a base, then maybe add one or two points. So that's what we wanted to see. We wanted to see the students using this answer format and formally sort of reflecting on their own sort of confidence, the self-assessment, using it as a learning tool in this formative assessment. So it was nice to see those comments come through. But quite a few were saying, oh, I just knew what my clinical knowledge was, so I just sort of wrote that number. Or I didn't have any strategy, just went on how confident I felt. They didn't tend to say they were looking at the numbers based on how confident I was and what I already knew. So they're just sort of going on their own sort of personal confidence, which is fine. But then others, which I think are slightly disheartening, uh, are, I gave a lower prediction than what they actually thought because I didn't want to feel bad if I do worse than my actual prediction. Uh, I'd always find I'm very critical of myself, so I'd always rate my confidence to be low. So they're deliberately rating low based on where they actually thought they were. And others were saying, I just went for the middle and they're sort of checking out here. They don't see any value in what they're doing. And it's these <laughs> comments here that really stimulate what we're going on. So final slide. Um, I've done this in other years. So this is a first year pharmacy students uh, and we see the same pattern. So this longitudinal pot is about four different formative tests that we did with them. We're seeing the same pattern. We're particularly seeing this really huge drop in confidence with the high performing students, but we do always see better calibration in the lower performing students. I think future studies need to really understand what this is. And what we tend to see when we make the test summative, when they actually, when they do some revision for this, the best students are able to bring their blue line up to meet the green line. You do get a closing of the gap at the lower performing quartile. And also you get the same pattern of good calibration in the lower performers, the lower calibration in the higher performers. And off the back of that, well, I need to, I think for what we're going to do next year is I'm going to try and give some training and self-assessment and have much more discussion around this process and how it feeds into their learning to see if we change their prediction profile. But also because a lot of students are saying, you know, you know, I just went for the middle. It says that a lot of them aren't really seeing the point of this. So hopefully the training will help with that next year. It does spark thoughts about just more authentic assessment in general. But I haven't got time to talk about that and I'll, I'll drop out now. Sorry, I've overrun. I apologise. Thank you, Paul. I'll stop it there. Perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, a question um, that we can move to, to, to both of you and, and Jane. Um, is about uh, the the moving to to the to the digital. Of course, there are a lot of other interesting comments in uh, in the chat, which um, I I will invite you to uh, check and reply to. Um, Jane, um, there is a lot of debate about uh, making good use of uh, breakout rooms. Uh, are you suggesting as a, a sort of silver bullet, making making it fun might actually be um, the, the the right way to actually break students in group and let them work as a team? And and Paul. It, did you actually find any uh, sharp differences when you actually move uh, from um, a paperwork to an online work? Not massive differences. Uh, we saw differences in the qualitative feedback. So we had the usual troubles that I think a lot of people would have had about the group dynamics. So <clears throat> when you move into breakout rooms, yeah. um, Particularly with like first year students, you know, they were, they were, I was getting a lot of feedback from students saying, well, there's only two of us doing anything. And a lot of people are just sort of, they're there in the room, but we know they're not there. And the group dynamic breaks down. So we struggle with the group dynamic. But then the feedback we were getting from the students from the training here was we really liked the group discussions. So Thanks. it's a bit hard to Jane, come what, to a concrete conclusion. Jane, uh, so how do you think about uh, redesigning or, or, or implementing what, what, what you've been doing in a, in a digital world? Um, so I have been um, doing it over the last year. It doesn't work so well for the serious gaming because you need the tutor to be more present for kind of, because it has to have that clearer purpose. It needs rules, it needs strong, stronger guidelines. Whereas for the game-based learning, I've been playing Pictionary and Hangman on Collaborate Ultra, which is really good because the platform allows you to do that and the students have a little bit of anonymity in so much that when they write on the slide, the name doesn't come up. So they really like the features of the whiteboard for collaboration. 
I completely agree with Paul for the kind of first second year undergrads the breakout rooms are good to start building that confidence we're talking to their peers but as they get into the later years they kind of drift away and the ability to have your you know to be in the room but not be in the room is very tempting so if we we're trying to encourage them to work together but you can't necessarily 100 percent know that they're physically there like currently we've got a lot of our colleagues in the chat with just those um little gray icons so i don't know they're actually there because i can't see them so it's maintaining where we're trying to encourage that engagement and it being active it's hard to monitor that in the breakout rooms yes this this will remain a, a topical conversation for the time that comes <laughs> no yeah, it's definitely yeah. something the way it's definitely going to be the way forward for a lot of the mm -hmm. programs and like i said for the game-based learning it's brilliant you know like we've i play a um well it's not really a game i do a task called um three word friday which is also to do with self-regulation and starting to think of what paul was saying about their awareness of their own confidence and what they do what they think they know about and what they don't necessarily know about and so it used to be in person that they would write on a post-it note three things that they were comfortable with and confident with on the on the module and three things they weren't so much now we just use the chat or we use the whiteboard so it's definitely things are definitely transferable but with what i was evaluating because of that importance of that peer support i think a lot of the students from the feedback that i've had in the last year whilst accessibility is much easier online the peer support isn't quite the same because you don't get those subtle communication talk like cues. You can't really tell if that person um, understands. They could. You can't, you can't see them nodding or shaking their head. Yes. So yeah, you're right, Fabio. So I think definitely with that will be ongoing in our research for a wee while to come. <laughs> so trying to design your platform, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that, we'll all just have to get together and design one. <laughs> <laughs> Fiona, is there anything particular from the chat that I missed that, that it would be uh, nice to, to flag up? I'm also conscious that we reached nine o'clock and some of our colleagues will have to leave uh, uh, the chat, but I will be happy to be around if, uh, if the conversation continues. No, there's been uh, quite a lot of questions about um, the, you know, what would happen if students were doing this for a summative test? Would, it, would they perform differently? Um, there's been um, a bit of chat about how in a group quiz there are, you know, there are the people who are loud and take over um, and think their answer is right compared to the quieter ones who probably are right. So it's how you get that group dynamic. But I think the uh, the solution somebody said was they had, uh, they would do have a group working together for four or five tests. So across that, hopefully the group dynamic would in, would would do evolve yeah that that yeah that's the that, that, that's what we observe you know and a lot of the feedback we get on this is students talking about their challenges with their group dynamics and then mm -hmm. then it's how you support them in developing those professional skills and you know the interprofessional interpersonal skills and how you help them develop those group dynamics and there's another learning opportunity that's thrown up then but that's why we deliberately keep them in the same groups for an extended period of time there's benefit in it yeah nothing else for me fabio well wait, it's um it's now uh one past one uh past nine and uh of course you mean i'm conscious about uh, keeping keeping colleagues in the room i know that paul needs to run into uh teaching uh at the moment i just want to take a moment to thank both um our speakers uh they were very engaging presentations and so virtual clap of hands uh, to them. Um, I will be sticking in the chat for a little uh, while if uh, uh, anybody uh, wants to continue the conversation. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thanks all for participating and thank you, Matthew, for uh, having us uh, once again uh, here with you today. And there's um, a feedback sheet uh, that Matthew's put up. If you could uh, fill that in, we'd be really grateful. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it would be great if people can fill the feedback survey. Let me just put the link in there again. 
Um, and just before everybody runs off, the next session in June will be a panel session with the Australian National Teaching Award winners. We'll be discussing online, exploring online assessment. Um, they tend to all have links to things like transforming assessment and, and the uh, Ascalite organisation in Australia, which is uh, technology in um, tertiary education. So should be an interesting panel from our a set of award winners in teaching in Australia. So thank you very much, folks, and we'll see you again, hopefully, on the 9th of June. Brilliant. See you then. Thank you.